for more than 25 years. He has traveled Kenya's political landscape like a colossus. <laughs> Registering many ups and downs as he scaled up the ladder that would eventually make his one of Kenya's most recognizable names and a notable figure in Africa's Hall of Fame. The culmination of a journey that began way before he even knew it. He was very fortunate that uh, he was being groomed uh, without his knowledge. <laughs> he was just a baby. And um, associating with um, the national leaders um, it became almost a, a natural for him. His politics didn't start with Moy. His aspirations didn't start with Moy. Maybe Moy boosted them and helped them, but he always had. He always had. And he, he seemed to have a very clear vision of what, what he would like to do for this country. Uhuru Mwegai Kenyatta, the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya, the man who made an unlikely entry into politics but became a consummate player even in his own succession. As the first president under a new constitutional dispensation to put in effect, despite the challenges, a whole new structure and system of governance. He sneaked into the political arena almost unnoticed. As his mentor and political benefactor Daniel Toroiti Charapmoe began pulling strings in the dying moments of his presidency, thrusting the second Kenyatta into the rough and tumble of Kenya's politics. We are now embarking on the final street stage which will lead this country a journey that had started at the dawn of Kenya's independence in the early 1960s, Uhuru Kenyatta was born on 26th of October 1961 to a couple that was destined to be Kenya's inaugural first family, Jomo Kenyatta and Mamangina Kenyatta. Indeed, the name Uhuru was meant to capture the spirit of freedom that was now just two years away. He would attend St. Mary's School in Nairobi before proceeding to the Amherst College in the United States to study economics, political science and government. But what awaited him in Kenya would define the rest of his life. Almost out of nowhere, Uhuru joined the political fray in 1997, gunning for the Gatondo parliamentary seat at the age of 36. Muigai, as he is known in his Gikoyo name, was confident of a win. After all, his father, President Jomo Kenyatta, had been member of parliament for the larger Gatondo constituency up until his death in 1978. But there were questions on why Uhuru should take up the mantle. First of all, the Gatondo people had very fond memories of his father, the little Jomo Kenyatta. And um, the Kenyatta also joined uh, politics or rather um, started leading Gatundu people when he was very advanced in years. So maybe he didn't do as much as he would have loved to do. And I thought it was only fair to give his son an opportunity maybe to do what his father always aspired to do. Contesting under the banner of the ruling Kenya African National Union Kanu, the young Kenyatta was set for a rough ride, and here is why. Kanu had been the party that had grown into a villain, a monster that would stop at nothing to eat all people that stood in the way of its dictatorial rule. The now defunct central province was one such region that had witnessed the wrath of Kanu as its leaders were persecuted, 
tortured and some detained after falling out with the then president Daniel Toroiti Charapmoi. Uhuru's own relatives in the political scene, such as his cousin Beth Mugo. So it's a government of liars, yeah. cowards, and they should face the opposition. What His uncle George Muhoho and Captain Kungo Mwigai had not been spared by President Moi's iron fist. Our family, a very difficult situation at that time. Because of course, uh, my uncle was the head of Kano. And this Kano was his party also. And that's why we were so divided, even us, even though we went the, the opposition way, it, it did not mean we did not understand why Uhuru had to go that way also. There are some in our family who remained in Kano and others who joined the opposition. So demonized had Kano become that instead of losing to what was by then the most Kikuyu friendly party such as the Democratic Party led by Mwai Kibaki, Uhuru Kenyatta lost to Moses Mwehia of the little-known Social Democratic Party, then led by Chari Tingilu. For those who were around like 87-year-old Samuel Wanjoguna, that election was anything but credible. So 97, he was defeated by Mwe. In a very chaotic, because they did some funny things eh, in Gatondo, <laughs> which really were not really credible. Or, they were dirty things. When he came to give According to retired Captain Kongo Mwegai, a man who refers to Kenya's fourth president as his brother, having grown alongside him in the precincts of State House and also in the Kenyatta home in Ishaweri, those events of the 1997 elections could have easily dimmed lights for a promising political career. That 1997 def uh, defeat was very humiliating. Uh, it was very disheartening for him. And... Uh, if there's, a, if there's a time he considered leaving politics, I think it was that time, because 97, and uh, um, he was new in politics, he had not experienced these things, and the tricks that were played on him, they were, he was running against somebody called Mwehia, and um, some people in Gatondo, they, they, they took Mwehia's car, I don't know, they slaughtered a goat or a hen and they put blood on his car and then the car was parked near our homestead and rumors went around that Mwehi had been killed and, uh, you know, people, people's emotions were, wow, yeah, so it was a bad experience for him, you know, especially being connected that he, he is that type of a person who can actually harm somebody for political Game. But that false start and the resulting despair by the young Kenyatta was not his first interaction with politics. How are you? The man that is now only days away from handing over the instruments of power to his successor. And Kenya's fifth president was literally brought up in a political oven. His father, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, rose to become Kenya's founding president when Uhuru Mwegai Kenyatta, the first son of his fourth wife, Ngena Muhoho, was barely three years old. That meant that for the next 14 years since 1964, Uhuru would be walking on the presidential red carpet side by side with Jomo, eating the president's food and stepping right onto his footprints while shaking hands with those who shook Jomo's. Indeed, photographs that have found themselves in the public have proved that Mwigai was Jomo's favorite son. So the association in itself was kind of giving him the aura of the presidency. The substance of it is another matter. Uh, but uh, socialization, uh, he was socialized that way. Um, the state house ambience was part of him. 
not to mention Gatundu, but uh, just stayed out. So that in itself made him appear as if he is cut out to be a prince. Eh? Uh, if Kenya was a monarchy, then he would be a prince, but Kenya is not a monarchy. It's a republic. Uh, but even in republics, you have people who appear to be properly groomed uh, for eventual takeover. He has never stayed at State House. He always stayed at Gatundu. The children would come to school and then go back home. Sometimes they might stay until the weekend and they'd go back. But he's brought up in a rural setting. Brought up like all other children. After the death of his father, Uhuru Kenyatta started showing subtle indications of his desire for politics. And just like an egg whose cheek was ready to hatch would show cracks, so did Uhuru's clamor for leadership show in the choices he made at that time. Among the choices he made was to leave the country for his studies. Some people didn't want him even to go to America. Among the family and friends. So it was now a very difficult decision for him now to leave the mother, to go, whereas the mother now is almost alone. Because the system now of Moi, there were some people who obviously were not really, you know, amiable to Mama Gena as having the same status as she was. But she was very tough. Though it is widely believed that his mentor, President Daniel Torete Charapmoi, inadvertently thrust President Uhuru Kenyatta into the political deep end, those who knew him dismissed the notion that the son of Jomo would have otherwise preferred a quiet life, focused on his and the family's businesses. That is a fallacy. As you, when it, let me show you something which you people don't know. And I will show you right away. So that you know, I know all of these things. Uhuru got married. Can you see these are what? These are minutes of the preparation for his wedding. 19 when? Wow. 1989. How many? You can even uh, take photographs of that. You'll see who are there. And uh, I am there. <laughs> yes, I can see your name. Assemble yes. Number eight. Yes. And how many are there? 38. So, when I tell you things, I talk from the strength of document. Uhuru, first of all, wanted to get married so that he can become an elder, not to go and start camp campaign or politics, yet he doesn't have a family. Where now we told him, now we are setting you, we are setting you free to go and they join politics because you have now become an elder. His politics didn't start with Moy. His aspirations didn't start with Moy. Maybe Moy boosted them and helped them, but he always had. He always had. And he, he seemed to have a very clear vision of what, what he would like to do for this country. Uhuru's mettle in actively taking part in a national political discourse was during the clamor for the repeal of Section 2A of the Constitution that had turned the country into a single-party state. During the period, President Moi had appointed a Kanu Review Committee led by the then Vice President, the late Professor George Saitoti, that was tasked with collecting the views of Kenyans on different issues, setting the stage for the repeal of Section 2A and a subsequent return to a pluralist democracy. Now Uhuru assembled his uh, uh, boy, his boy like uh, the son of Tom Boyer, the son of uh, a few of those who won. In the, during the struggle, to go and select, uh, uh, present their memorandum to that committee. And he said, if I remember his word, even the voice of young people must be heard. <laughs> so it used to be in town, people saying, whenever they see him, oh, we are hearing you young people. So when he came, when we talked about it, and of course we used to talk, I could see a young man with some potential in politics, 
but he's in a kind of a quagmire because some relatives are not with him, they are in another party, others are. So in most cases, he was indecisive at that time. The only person who was studying with him was Kung and Mama Gena Kinyata. Not influencing too much, but allowing him to have the space. That time, the whole family was in the opposition. Actively so, very actively in the opposition. In fact, uh, we, me and my elder brother Gengi were very actively involved in the second liberation to the extent that we are locked up by Moi many times. And uh, so Uhuru being in Kanu was rather untenable. And uh, I must commend him because he stuck there and uh, he didn't waver. And uh, as you have co correctly put it, in 202, he ran for president on a Kanu ticket. Our own uncle, George Mohoho, was with Moi Kibaki. Our own big sister, Senator Beth Moho, was with Moi Kibaki. So it was not easy for Uhuru. But uh, he's stuck in there, I believe, his principles. Those principles that set him aside from most of his family members would see him stick to the unpopular Kanu party, even becoming the party's branch chairperson in Gatondo, ahead of his resounding loss to Mwehia. He's a very reasonable person. I think he understood. He did not show anger. He did not show dislike. We did not change our relationship. Uh, we just went on as usual. He, re as it was even then, I, I think he understood very well where we were coming from. And my view, we did not just change to go this way or that way. We found it, we were part of when the, 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 the opposition started. Uhuru, who all through his 25 years in active politics has only lost in two elections, the one against Moses Mwe here in 1997. <laughs> and the other against Mwai Kibaki in 2002, was between 1998 and 2002, treated to an unceremonious rise to the national platform. First in 1999 when President Moi appointed him as the chairperson of the Kenya Tourism Board and later in 2001 when he was nominated to parliament replacing longtime Moi ally Mark Toh who had to step down in favor of the son of Jomo. But the biggest stage was yet to come. In the run-up to the 2002 general election, the then leader of the National Development Party NDP Raila Odinga had dissolved his party in favor of a merger with the ruling party Kanu in a tactical move that would eventually sound a death knell for the independence party. <laughs> Many pundits believe that Raila had expected a ringing endorsement from the outgoing President Moi, but the self-declared professor of politics had his own plans. So you had these people who claim to be the youth dreaming they are going to take over from Moi. Hmm? Since Moi has to go. You heard Kalonzo Musioka. He keeps on grumbling that he should have been the one. You had Musali Amudavadi. You had George Saitoti who was insulted. You were saying you are my friend, but you are not fit to be president. And you had Raila. All of them expecting that Moi would anoint them as he lives. And Moi had uh, different ideas. So he had started bringing Uhuru into the fold in the 19th. Appoint him chairman of this, ensure he's, appoint, he's, ele he's elected Kanu something. Uh, 
he stood in 1997, lost the election anyway, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So he had been uh, being prepared to be lifted up. I was, a, I was one of the people who found it very difficult to, to work under that condition, although I had to. And uh, I used to joke that I need to go for counseling to mention the word Kanu. <laughs> but, uh, I remember the late Jenga Karume because we, we were also in opposition. When, when we were forced to join Kanu, he, he gave me a, a very practical example to the captain, you know, if you take a panga to cut somebody and he fends off with your child, what do you do? He told him you put the panga down. So he told me now put it down because this man has fended with, his, with, our, with our son. Moi, old man to Muse Kenyatta because of the change of constitution. You remember? He retained him against all these other people who were against him. All the noise. <laughs> all the noise. So Moy had a soft heart for Kenyatta family. But as time went on, and he saw that he now Uhuru is now interested in politics, Moi, do you know the, the meaning of Moi? M-O-I means my own interest. <laughs> my, he was doing it for his own interest. <laughs> Clever man he was, because he saw this young man. I can maneuver him, I can be around, and I believe he will not uh, be against me. The number of people who are disappointed was, was big. Hmm? Which then made uh, Raila Odinga very desperate. Having dissolved his own party to join Kanu in the hope of benefiting. We did not work out that way. He was put in a dilemma. And when he grumbled about betrayal, uh, Moe's supposed betrayal, he was insulted. But Raila Odinga was not the only one who felt betrayed. Moi's own vice president, Professor George Saitoti, was also up in arms. Come a time, there come a time when the nation is more important than an individual. Others who left the Moi camp in droves and abandoned the novice Uhuru Kenyatta included Kalonzo Musioka, William Olen Timama, Moody Awori and many others. By now, Odinga had put up his Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, that would later join Mwai Kibaki of the Democratic Party, Kijana Wamalua of Ford, Kenya, and Charity Ngilu of the National Party of Kenya, NPK, to form the National Alliance for Change and later the National Rainbow Coalition that would serve the young Kenyatta a hot defeat. The way he took it also helped us as family, those of us who were uh, on the other side. But it did not remove, you feel a sadness. There was a sadness. It's my younger, is like my younger brother. And um, there is no way you can completely divorce yourself. But of course then the other side is the country. It was kind of a relief when the opposition won. That's what we had wanted. On the other side, I knew my cousin was happy. With the start of the new millennium in the 2000s, also opened a new chapter in the political history of Uhuru Kenyatta. Not only did he receive a tap on the back from his political mentor, President Daniel Toroiti Charap Moi, but here he would also change the political faces that would support his political journey henceforth. Those left in support of the young Kenyatta were young politicians, mostly from the Rift Valley region, out of the respect they had for their then political supremo, Daniel Moe.
Rais Moyo akatuambia nataka musaidie Uhuru Kenyatta aniridhi kama kama rais. Wengine wana siasa wakati huo vigogo wa siasa katika bonde la Ufa marehemu Nicholas Biwat, mheshimiwa Henry Kosgei na wengine wakakaa nyuma wakakoa na baridi kwa sababu kulikuwa na ule uh, upepo ilikuwa unavuma wa NAC wakati huo. Na sisi tulikuwa tunajua kwamba Rais Moyo ana mpango badala uh, wakati anatuambia tumsaidie tum, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Tukamsaidia Uhuru Kenyatta lakini wakati wa uchaguzi nakumbuka kabisa wakati tulikuwa tunazunguka uh, eneo nyingi za Rift Valley ilikuwa ni mimi Mheshimiwa Ruto na uh, na bwana Rigatha ambaye alikuwa uh, PA wa Uhuru ama msaidizi wake ndio tulikuwa tuna, tuna, tunazunguka katika Rift Valley. Hao vigogo wengine wa Rift Valley walikuwa wame, wameenda kando. Lakini matokeo yakatokezea na tukapoteza hiyo kie, kiti cha urais lakini urafiki ukaya, uka, ukaendelea. Musalia Mudavadi was touted to be the vice president designate had Uhuru clinch power. The central province that had for years supported Uhuru's father was now unashamedly rejecting him. Those two the defeats were devastating. They were not small defeats at presidential level and uh, first of all at the constituency level, then at the uh, pre national level presidency. And it shows his determination. As you're saying, um, he was not looking for the presidency so that he gains materially or anything like that. Right? He had uh, his own ambition, what he wants to do for Kenyans. And um, so for him to rise, he falls and rises. I think that's how great people are described. It's not in what you are, you, you are but rise falling and then rising again, falling and then rising again. I think that's a description of a great man. Yeah. I accept the choice of the people, and in particular, now concede that Mr. Mwai Kibaki will be the third president of the Republic of Kenya. Mimi Mwai Kibaki na hapa kwamba nitakuwa muaminifu wa Jamhuri ya Kenya. And for the first time since its formation almost 40 years prior, Kanu became the official opposition party. I am party. greatly honored for the confidence you have and, and extended to me and I promise to not to let you down. And its chairman Uhuru Kenyatta effectively became the leader of official opposition. In the new NAC government, it did not function because right from the start it Start, they start quarreling as to who should have what power. The power wrangles that Professor Masharia Munene is talking about would within months lead to a discourse for a constitutional change. <laughs> In the sunset days of President Moi's regime, there were conversations about overhauling the independence constitution, which had by now been mutilated beyond recognition. The constitution review process that had been sabotaged by Moi's surprise dissolution of parliament would resume shortly after the 2002 general election, setting the country for more political realignments. It did not simply continue with where it had been stopped. It became now an instrument of political contention in the NAC team between the Kibaki side and the Raila side. And they went through some changes here and there. And that conference had so much donor input, external input. It sometimes looked as if it was not a Kenyan thing. Huh? Uh, which led to the 205 referendum, which was a disaster. The leader of the official opposition was Uhuru Kenyatta. But because of the internal opposition within the government, he appeared to be subsumed yeah, under Raila. So the real uh, leader of the opposition was within, uh, yeah, was Raila. Uhuru is just the official there in parliament. 
But the person seemingly calling the shots was who? Was Raila. What Uhuru did, or, or Raila did at that time, they were both, you can say, they are both clearly were in the opposition. And one is more louder than the other one. But it doesn't mean that one, look at President Kibaki, how good he was. Was he loud? No, sometimes even people said he sits on the fence. It's, we are gifted differently how we, we act. But I think President Uhuru, when he was in the opposition, he also achieved what an, of, an official position should. Throughout 2005, Uhuru would lead Kanu in supporting the then rebels in government. Their unity led to the defeat of the proposed constitutional changes that had been supported by the government led by President Mwai Kibaki. The results of the referendum thus gave rise to the rebelling faction in government that would stage an opposition to Mwai Kibaki's re-election in 2007. Pandits say that this was the period Uhuru's star shone again as he shelved his ambitions for president, becoming Kenya's first leader of the official opposition to support the re-election of a sitting president. <laughs> atambue wazee na wakina mama ambao wamejaa katika hall hii na ajue hawa ndio watakuwa wakifanyia yeye kazi he looked at the situation of kibaki factor that this man definitely this man kibaki has something to offer to the mount kenya region because matiba now had become a kind of a spend force he found that he can only be better off with the Kebaki. So they now teamed up against his rider. By the act of joining Kebaki at that time, it endeared him to the Mount Kenya people. And you can rest assured, that's why you heard about the Kumira Kumira Dura Kuduraku, you know, that turnout during his election. So, as I said, Uhuru is a brilliant man. He's very, very, very smart. And uh, I can assure you, all those moves he made himself. Don't let anybody cheat you that I don't know his mother advises him. Our mother is an old lady. She will not understand all these things. A dark cloud would, however, engulf the country after the December 2007 elections that led to violence. At least 1,000 people were killed, many more displaced. Women were raped and humanity had sunk to its lowest in the nation's history. Men went against each other and communities were embroiled in tribal clashes. He didn't paint himself as a defender of the Gemma and Kikuyus. Gemma and Kikuyus painted him <laughs> the defend, their defender. And don't forget, as I had told you before, we were going through this very difficult time. And with that came the ghost of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The ICC benefited Uhuru politically. It was supposed to derail him, to fix him. Instead it boomeranged because the public saw victimization here. International chicanery. I uh, remember Johnny Carson in Washington saying, remember, choices have, consequences. choices have consequences. If you choose wrongly, you are going to see dust or something like that. Eh? Then you had a, uh, the British High Commissioner, new one, fresh, appointed, uh, barely three weeks in the country and he's making strange statements about how people should vote. In. I remember him talking to me one day. That time that people were rumoring he wants to abandon. I asked him, why, why you want and he told me, you know, imagine my young daughter, his daughter Gena, was a young girl then. He said, can you imagine my young daughter Gena asking me, Daddy, when, when did you kill these people and rape all these people? Did you actually do it? And 
I could see I could see the agony in his eyes because he had to explain this to his children. But the ICC tagline on his neck was not Uhuru's only battle at that time. Back at home, he had to contend with simmering discontent in his party, Kanu. We love him, but we can see it. <laughs> anyway, again, the kitty eco. You have. As the Kibaki succession politics caused ripples in central province. At the center of the central province Jitas was the question on who would succeed President Kibaki as the regional kingpin and subsequently as the presidential candidate. Though a huge chunk of the regional leaders were in support of Uhuru's rise, there were those against it. Yet another meeting was held in Limuru, this time to disagree with the plan to install the son of Jomo as the political supremo. The late David Gitari, who was the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Kenya, former Mungiki leader Mainan Jenga, and lawyer come politician Paul Mwite were leading the anti-Uhuru faction. Realizing that he was caught up in a Kite 22, Uhuru realized that the only way to go and make a serious stab at the presidency when Kibaki was retiring was to come out with a new outfit. This would serve two or three purposes. One, it would give him a new outlook. It would make him a new and independent personality, free from the tentacles and the manacles that had defined the Kanu regime. And above all, it would give him a clean sweep as a man who had a new ideology and a new way of seeing things. The ghost of crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court and a need to find President Kibaki's successor as the Gema Supremo made Uhuru rethink his politics. He would immediately take over the National Alliance Party of Kenya, NAPK, and transform it to the National Alliance, TNA. And in a completely unexpected move, thrust completely unknown but truthful people as the face of the party. So when he introduced Sakaja to his inner court team, and Onyangulo as his chairman and secretary general respectively, I can tell you the old guard were up in arms. And they were telling him this is madness. You can't gamble with your political future. You cannot bring a totally unknown people and hope to clinch your presidency. But I'll tell you one interesting thing. He stood up and told them, it is a leap of faith. This is a new beginning. I'm going with this gentleman. I am convinced they are up to the task. TNA's assignment had been cut out and part of the work was to come up with a winning formula to succeed Kibaki, but also to wash out the ICC tag, as well as seeking suitable partnerships for a win. Uru is one man who does not play politics from the heart. He plays it from his head. Having worked on different scenarios, whether we were able to win these elections on our own, as the National Alliance, it was becoming increasingly obvious that that would be a haculent task. It would be possible, but it wouldn't be easy. It would be actually impossible if Ruto had joined Raila. So Uhuru, out of his own volition, and by the way, without seeking consent from anybody, reached out to William Ruto. Remember, even Raila had reached out to William Ruto at that time. He was a gentleman that everybody now needed to tilt the balance. Tukakuwa na mkutano kadha wa kadha mpaka tukaambiana na Mheshimiwa Uhuru tuungane tupige hii siasa ya ICC pamoja kwa sababu hii sio kesi ya, ya vile vile imepangwa ni siasa. Na tukakutana, tukafanya maombi, tukafanya tuliofanya mpaka Mwenyezi Mungu akatusaidia akatuokoa kwa hiyo minyororo ya ICC. The specter of the ICC charges at some point cost some of Uhuru supporters to rethink his strategy. They toyed with the idea of fronting Musalia Mudavadi as a compromise candidate just in case matters did not go well at The Hague or the duo was prevented from running. But a group of central Kenya legislators would hit the roof 
telling Uhuru at a hurriedly conveyed press conference that he had no choice but to run for presidency. Uhuru would now make the now infamous statement blaming spiritual beings for the Mudavadi debacle. <laughs> And so what was thought impossible became reality as Uhuru Kenyatta, now on his second term at the presidency, joined hands with William Ruto against Raila Odinga and Kalonzo Musyoka. Jubilee is the only political party. And for months, Kenyans would be treated to flashy campaigns with a duo that had christened itself as the digital generation. The 2013 election would also be the one to usher in a government that would rule under the 2010 constitution. On the 4th of March 2013, Kenyans went to the poll to vote in their new government. The Uhuruto team would be declared winners in the presidential contest on the 10th of March 2013. They had garnered a total of 6,173,433 votes against Odinga's 5,340,546,000 votes. I, Uhuru Kenyatta. I thought this was fruition of very strict upbringing, a very honest person, a caring person, somebody who has no vedetta as or, you know, somebody kind, I don't know how I would put it, just the right person who would do right for this country. That's what I, 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 I felt. That oath would usher in a checkered presidency with many accomplishments. One whose end became just as dramatic as its beginning, with many intrigues and endless conspiracy theories and varied views on how the second Kenyatta should be remembered. I am the first sitting president, number one, to vie and lose and accept. I'm the first sitting president to vie, win, and have an election uh, uh, um, nullified. And I accepted that, right? At the age of 61 years and at the tail end of his presidency, Uhuru Kenyatta leaves office with a multi-dimensional history. To some, he is the man who demystified the presidency from the good old strictness and firmness associated with the highest office of the land for over 40 years, while to others, his ability to work through different situations still stand out and he will be remembered for years to come. Ibrahim Karanja, NTV.